I think they're exposed. I think mainstream media are exposed. You know why? Mm. Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm. They are exposed. This should give people another great example of now we have we do have a voice and we have, you know, the ability to make a change. Do you still get questions from people back home saying, what on earth are you doing in Saudi? I had so much hate from the Western world being here. It was so many different aspects So much of hate. hate from the Western world. So much hate. Saudi had the biggest disadvantage because that was a time where tourists couldn't come to Saudi. It's only now people are able to form their, form their own opinions outside of the media, which is... I think typically negative. I think that's the beauty of podcasts is that it's real and we kind of break down those barriers. How would you answer the question of of enemies and where you are, if you have any, in forgiving them? Do I have people that have done me wrong and intentionally hurt me? Yes. But I didn't ask you a question yet. Whenever you're ready. Is there any specific event or moment that stands out to you in the most that contributed to your growth or to who you are right now today? One above all. Media, just be yourself, God damn it. That's right. 2023. 2023, episode 99, <laughs> Paris in the house. How are you doing? I, I, I didn't like Paris in the house. That's way too 90s. <laughs> um, you like 90s? I do like 90s. Probably born in the 90s, huh? Yeah, 95. That's when I know I feel old. We have Paris Vera in the house for the second time on the Mo Show podcast. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Paris, welcome, on, well, welcome back on the show. I'm used to saying welcome to the Mo Show, but <laughs> one of the first times I had to say welcome back to the show. How you been? Oh, good. It feels great to be back. It feels really like a full circle. Jeddah or the Mo Show or both? All of it. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. So, I mean, not many people know this, uh, unless those who probably watched the first episode who have been who, who have been following your career. Six years in Saudi now. Correct. My sixth year. I don't think many people back home would have thought you'd last longer than a year. Oh, for sure. And if you guys remember back from the first episode with my mom, she had the intention of coming here, stay one year, see how she likes it, and then fell in love. I came, I fell in love, and... I'm so grateful to call this place home. I feel lucky to have experienced such a different way of life than to where I came from. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't change any of any of that. Amazing. It's more years to come. Did it did it, it fly? I mean, I can't believe it's been six years. When when we shot in Feb 21, I'm not a creep. We actually went back and, <laughs> and we checked. Yeah, uh, sure, Mo. The, the day, <laughs> the day. You were here for a year, uh, two years. Then, mm-hmm. like you 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 came in 2019. Was it? At the end of 2018. So yeah, 2018. and at that time I was still traveling around quite a bit. So yeah, I've been solid in Saudi at that time, maybe two years, not too long. Yeah. Throughout the whole COVID experience. Yes. Yeah. Are you still are you still on on the move, looking for locations, uh, active in the field of photography? Yes. Um, I would say though, this past year and a half has been kind of a it's been a very transformative time for me for myself. So although I've done a lot of exploring around the world and around Saudi, this year was kind of exploring deeper into myself and my purpose and giving back that purpose. So um, not so much exploring locations, but I feel like I've covered pretty much 90% of Saudi and the locations that I then was like, how can I not just share through my art and through an image, but how can I actually give back and share the experience? with my viewers and with the people that are, you know, interested. It's home for you, huh? Very much home. I feel like it felt home for you from the early days as well. Yes. That was what surprised me because, you know, I spent so long, I grew up in the U.S. and I traveled all around the world. And then when I came to just visit my mom, never in a million years would I even care to make it a, a place at that time that I would stop willingly. You know, that was way back in the time before we really knew of Alula, knew of any of this. I came just to see her and I fell in love with it from that moment because the people made me feel at home and made me feel welcomed and how I could be so different but make me feel so at home was super crazy for me to to comprehend. But And you've been, you've been what, what's your country count at this point? I remember when you came on two and a half years ago, you, you, you had some impressive figures. 
I'm like, what did I have then? Again, I've spent... 50, 50, 40, 50 countries. Yeah, I'm probably at like 60, 60 now? something. Well, I blame Corona for, for three years. Of it definitely it lost. Yeah. But in that time, I took that time to explore Saudi. Okay. So I explored, you know, every corner of this country during COVID, which I was grateful for. And that was even more felt like true exploration because it's like people haven't crossed these borders and boundaries. So it was really that sense of real adventure, which I loved, which felt like I had been to a million countries. And you were here two years ago, Paris. You said something that kind of put my platform on the map. It was episode 16 when you came. I was doing it for three months. And you said something that caught fire on Twitter. This page translated it or dubbed it or translated it. And it was you and your mom. People were like, who are these two? Oh, they're in Saudi. Who are they talking to? Saudi guy, Saudi podcast. And it caught fire. You said try to quote you correctly. Um, I feel so safe in this country to the point that I can walk around with a million dollars on my head and nobody will touch me. Uh, three or four years later, do you stand by that statement? Absolutely, 100%. And that is one of the core reasons why Saudi is still home for me because safety is number one. And especially as a woman, you know, anybody that's traveled outside of Saudi in their home country, the US, Europe, they know, or maybe they don't realize until you actually come more safe. And then when you leave, you realize how aware of your, of every little thing you have to be safety wise. You have to worry about everything, your bag, your this, you can't, you know, leave your laptop out here. People leave, you know, their designer purses, <laughs> their laptops at a cafe, go to the bathroom, go outside, come in. Nobody's going to touch any of it. So still to this day, I could do the same and nobody would touch me. It's really beautiful. It's very special. I don't know many places in the world, if any that you could do that still. We shot something with Saudi tourism in London a week ago. And at the end of the day, my co-host said, Mo, we have to pack everything up. I'm like, no, but the cameras are in the perfect angle and, and the mics and, and please don't. She's like, and she's a British lady, Sarah Headley Heimers, amazing co-host, shout out to Sarah. <laughs> oh. um, and she was like, Mo, this is London, yeah? We can't leave things out. <laughs> it's my English I accent. I and I was that. like, yeah, you're right. But we are at a convention, it's like, no. And and that's when, for a second, I was like, wow, you know, obviously Europe, London, namely, has a bad rep, but even in an enclosed convention center that is patrolled and locked and we're in a booth that's locked inside of a locked convention, she was like, no. Wow. So you're right. People do take it for granted. For sure. You, it becomes part of a way of life that you've accepted subconsciously. But when you come somewhere like Saudi and you really realize, you know, you can leave your front doors unlocked, you can leave your laptop out, which is nice for me because I'm editing all the time. I'm in a cafe, want to run and grab another like drink or something, and I can just leave everything there peacefully. It's it's really priceless. You are a big, you and your mom are, I'm going to guess how many cats you have in your house. <laughs> Nine. We actually have less now. Um, so throughout these years, we've rescued a lot, but we've also lost a handful Lost through out. like unfortunate events, whether it was like a dog fight was kind of a recent one, a car hitting them was a recent one. Um, I actually have a funny story that I've never shared and didn't think I'd ever share with the public. It's a good time to share. Yeah, I guess <laughs> we've had the very first two cats we got. One was from Jetta, we rescued from Jetta. The other one my mom had rescued before I'd got there. So at that point we had these two female cats and when we got one more past that second, we started rescuing a few here and there. Even if they stayed with us kind of a foster, we started to get more coming in and out of the house. Well, these cats that were the sweetest cats in the world, I thought, decided that maybe they got on their, we put them on their princess throne. They did, they wanted to be the only cats. They moved out of our house willingly. But this one specifically, the first cat my mom ever had, she went on our kitchen table and she left a present for us and we never saw her again. Number two? Yes. On the kitchen table. And we never, I didn't think I'd ever say this out loud, but we never saw her again. She was like, you guys, I'm angry at you. You will be certain to know and moved out. And she wanted to just live on the streets and have like other people love her in this. But I respect that. They had the freedom to do that. So we visit them here and there. But two of my female cats have chosen to move out and they were like my favorites and I love them. But they just wanted to be the only cats and I respect them for that. So that it's is, kind of funny stories of rescuing cats from the streets and making them into these beautiful animals. And they're like, you know what? I respect you because you have boundaries. You know what you want and you won't accept anything else. You will leave the environment. 
It's an, I just turned this somehow into an analogy for life, but yeah. <laughs> I didn't think cats have the ability to have the wherewithal of being able to send a message in a way that they that, that they do you know what I mean? Didn't like, realize. The, 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 but they're smart. Coherent, coherent enough. Because because I don't think dogs have the wherewithal for that. Right. They say that they think that they don't, but But cats it's... have this thing where they, they think that they are the, 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 the queen of the house. They yeah. have this they're on their they're on their high horse or throne. Yeah. The, the, there, is, there is that element of it, right? Yeah, I've learned that, definitely. <laughs> Especially with that circumstance. Yeah. So now you're down to what, six? Five. Maybe about like six here and there. They're mostly outdoor now. Okay. Um, but by choice, they just like being outdoors, and um, we have like air conditioning that can go outside. But they just like to be out there. So it's it's been nice and peaceful. It's nice. We have a blind one that found her way to us, and I remember that one. Yeah. So there's just been a lot of. It's very fulfilling to be able to you know give back in that way, help what's at your doorstep. You know, they just even if it's feeding cats on the streets that you see them, it just gives some sense of purpose. Like they get a good day and an easy day for them. That brings me a lot of happiness and you know we have the means to do that so why not i think animals and humans you know how we treat animals is is just as important as how we treat humans i think you could learn a lot about a person in how they treat an animal 100 percent. my mom would also agree with that as a preschool teacher um she teaches them very young to not even step on the ants mm -hmm. and she'll appreciate me saying this because she's always been no, don't kill the ant. It's all about your intention and putting it out there to kill something, to do this. Uh, I think it's really special and important. And she's taught me this, to teach them from a young age, to have that empathy towards all creatures, all beings. Like she's the one to save the spiders, everything, which it's not easy. <laughs> I don't know if I'll save a spider, but, but you're, you're definitely <laughs> making me think about it. It's hard spiders for Spiders terrify me. Yeah. I used to see them in our... Whenever we'd be in London back in the day, I, I, that's where they pop up, these daddy long legs. Oh. That, that, yeah. I have like a trauma story from daddy long legs since I was a kid. Is and it true that if they're, if the human skin wasn't as thick, they would be poisoned? Is that this true? Is the, they say this is the truth. Wow. When I first, I didn't like camping because when I was four years old, four or five years old, I remember it like it was yesterday. We were in Illinois camping for my first time on this little island along the lake. And I woke up. And the entire, the tent had been a little bit open. The entire inside was covered with daddy long legs, like a horror film. Oh so ever since then, I've always been sensitive. I'm like, mom, this is going to take time for me to really accept that. We're going to catch this and set it free. I'm like, y you, go catch, you go catch it then, mom. <laughs> go for it. Have fun. Do you still get questions from people back home saying, what on earth are you doing in Saudi? Not so much anymore which it's been a long road. I think after, after Ronaldo <laughs> came, they're probably like, okay, she, she, she probably chose the right country to live in. But, but on yeah. some level, like not this year, but maybe the years leading up to this year, did you feel in one way or another that you could be like a, a spokesperson for the, for the region, for the country? Definitely. And, you know, we had spoken on the previous podcast, that initial kind of question was, are you being paid to do this? So we, we debunked that. So you guys have to go watch episode 16. I believe that I believe the theory. Well, you do have to watch episode 16. I believed the theory a little bit for a split second that your mom was CIA. <laughs> <laughs> that was your reaction the first time. That's why that was her reaction. <laughs> I love because we've had instances where people are like, wait a minute, are they in the CIA? Even here, they're like, why did they love Saudi so much? It's got to be fake. They got to be in the CIA. I'm like, <laughs> why can't they genuinely love Saudi? I don't know. But yeah, right. Yeah, it's. It's funny. So it's yeah, I've worked my way up to just, this is genuinely how I felt from the beginning where I was gaining, I had so much hate from the Western world being here. It was so many different aspects. So much of hate, hate from the Western world. So much hate. Like that was me just staying true to, to that. I genuinely love this place and wanted to share it with everybody. And I didn't really care who stays or who unfollows or who goes because it's, I love this place. And staying true to that has led me to an audience that is here and actually is reaching out from the Western world and wants to visit. How can we visit? How can we, like, can I hire you to come and show me, you know, you've opened my eyes. Like, instead of taking a family vacation to Florida or Bahamas or something, we want to come to Saudi Arabia. Like, we want something different. We love what you're showing. And that is huge. And it's so beautiful to say that when you're true to yourself, you know, the path aligns. And it's, it's paid itself off in not a money way, in a way that's much deeper and more fulfilling than anything that money could have you know, convince me I would never accept anything, money or anything 
if I didn't love or believe in a place. Yeah, it's anyway. not you. It's not you. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. You came a year after the vision was announced, and 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 you need to be credited for that because you're not coming now that people are seeing the fruits of that labor. Mm -hmm. You were here when a year after the vision was announced, we no, n nothing was seen yet. We were still in construction stages. Mm -hmm. But just going back to what you were saying earlier, yeah, there, there I think s cinemas opened in 20, late 2018, 2019. Women only started driving then. Yep. So you were here at a time where things were still the way they used to be. For sure. And you still called it home. I still loved it. Yeah. I loved it in those. And now there's a lot more. To, now there's a lot more to do. Of course, there's more to love. But back then, we were just starting off with step one. Because the core of every country is its people. We are not our government. You are not your government. When the people strike you from that moment, it didn't matter what anything says, what any media wants to say. I felt that core connection with the humans here that made me feel at home and welcomed it didn't matter all the glitz and the glam and the events and the movies and that like yeah that's nice but that's just a cherry on top i don't remember an occasion where mainstream ever said oh look what's great that's happening in saudi or the region and i think that's one of the biggest issues in the world is that media and your you know your news stations and all of this focus on the bad the conflict and I've preached this since I was young. When I started traveling the world, the issue I had with the States, which what I grew up in, was that everything was always negative. Everything was negative. And I'm like, well, what about the good? About Saudi? Everything. Everything. Everything they I see, they focus on the negative. And Saudi had the biggest disadvantage because that was a time where tourists couldn't come to Saudi. So the only thing that people had was the bad. They didn't have people speaking or showing the good. So you can't really blame them for the only thing that they knew was just the bad and no one else could visit. So they couldn't form their own opinions at that time. It's only now people are able to form their, form their own opinions outside of the media, which is, I think, typically negative. I think that's the beauty of podcasts is that it's real and we kind of break down those barriers. We get that chance to. And also me with social media, I feel that, you know, my page is an escape, a piece, um, a place where... I'm not really going to talk about the news because for me, this is a place that I can go to and happy place to see the lights or see things in a, you know, a, a pretty or peaceful form. And we need more of that. We need more peace. We need more positive things. Like, I don't want to ever stop doing that. Like, no matter what's going on in the world, we need this. We need more of this. Me too. And and it gives power to the people. I always say the, 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 the microphones were in the hands of few and today it's hands of many. Um, true. I mean, I, I, I really don't see myself in media. I don't think I'm a media person, but but whether I like it or not, I am media today. You are media today. Yes. 20 years ago, do you think we would have been able to be media? No. Decentralized media. No. God bless it. Yeah. And That's, it's so powerful. It is. Mm -hmm. And and that was another thing is that I didn't, I never tried to be where I am today. I never was like, I want to be an influencer. I want to be a social personality. Whereas now I think the kids in school are probably like, I'm going to be an influencer. But it's like, YouTuber. I just shared. I wanted, I had a voice that I wanted to share this or share my art or whatever it may be. And that grew naturally. And so it has put us in a position to be able to, that I'm grateful for, to share different perspectives other than just, you know, the TV stations, the media, the news. I think they're exposed. I think mainstream media are exposed. You know why? Mm. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm. They are exposed. Yep. It, but but for the first time, and I and I actually posted this on my Instagram. I said, "What's happening right now in Palestine, and what's mm -hmm. happening to the Palestinians in the social media era, mm -hmm. is doing no favors to the perpetrators." And that's where we come in as people to show the real story. Definitely. And you see people like Rahma Zain. I remember when I started following her, she was at 15 to 20,000 followers. See, she's at 887K today. Say Rahma, you know why? Because she was caught in a moment that went viral when she lashed out on the CNN reporter saying, capture this, you are shooting that. Capture this, do this. Maybe we put the clip in right now. Where are your companies? Where is your channel covering this? Cover this. Say the truth, we understand you're an employee. You're just a puppet, you're just a mouthpiece. Come talk to me like a human being. Come talk to me like a human being. Thank you. I understand you have your foreign policy. No, I've heard you. I've heard you. 
you hear me. I understand you have your foreign policy. I understand you speak for your government. I understand you represent your government. But that being said, you're a country that's claimed free speech. Your customized democracy is actually what led to Hanos. And now we are watching an occupation and we are watching the result of your silence. And just because of that, she is now, she went on Pierce Morgan, she's a household name, and she's not a... She, this is great. You know what I mean? Like, like she's this not an influencer, she's right. not a journalist, but she spoke her heart, and now it 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 it, it reached so many people, and, and she's one of the reasons why people are starting to realize that, wow, is that really what's happening on the ground in For Palestine? Sure. You know what I mean? And Power to the people. Absolutely, and this gives... This should give people another great example of now we have we do have a voice and we have, you know, the ability to make a change, which is also, you know, I think a lot of issues we just felt like, oh, it's like, what could one person do? You know, we feel like we're helpless. But that proves that what one person can do can change a whole lot. Yeah. So if each of us make those steps, then it would be a better world. Yeah. Just like the cat issue, everyone just took care of the cat <laughs> outside the. Yes. But, but but you're right. It, it's it's the common theme. It's the common denominator. Like if everyone said it's not my fault, it's not my business, then the world is going to be a shit show. Yeah. But if everyone took care of their part, strength in numbers. You know, you add everyone together, and all of a sudden, you 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 can make a difference. Absolutely. You, you can make a change. Absolutely. Um, this is the the positives of social media for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we should use that. Totally, and I appreciate you participating and, and welcoming the topic of, of the Palestinian issue for a person who, who does not, uh, you know, get involved with politics. And I can understand that. Mm -hmm. But because it's a humanitarian thing and, and because sure. you are a humanitarian. Absolutely. Empathy. I'm the, one of the most empathetic people. And, you know, it's a blessing and a curse to feel everything so deeply. Um, but this case, you know, specifically, especially as a Westerner, is maybe shocking, but... Again, at the end of the day, we are humans. Bottom no, line. we are humans. And if you're not going to stomp on an ant, you know, don't stomp on a human. So I think it just all, we all need to be better people and the world would just really be a better place. And that's important to, you know, preach that and not just preach it, but actually live it. I think it's easy for us to repost this and repost that. And, and even often it's, you know, in our instincts to be reactive and be angry. Um, but you know, hate doesn't drive out darkness. Like there's a quote, um, and love is what drives out darkness. You have to give love, be love, embody that and live that, um, in order for, you know, the small changes to equal the big changes. So you can't fight fire with fire. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's true. I love what you said. I think that's like one of my favorite takeaways so far in this episode is that if you're not going to stamp on an ant, you know, you shouldn't stamp on a human. Mm -hmm. And and what we're seeing is the world stamping on humans, and mm -hmm. and and not just with what we're seeing right now. Obviously, right now it's 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 everything because it's it's hitting our it's hitting us on 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 TV on our social media, um, but in 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 many other cases as well like there's there's you feel like there's almost more hate than love in yep. the world these mm -hmm. days and that's uh i also loved what you said paris about how don't just repost and feel like you've done your part for society you know mm -hmm. like that that's actually live it like stand by it don't don't do it because that's what looks good in front of the eyes of your followers like i, I call bullshit on that i think it's easy to fall into that trap as you know even especially anybody with any sort of platform. And it's like, it is easy. post what you feel and, and embody that and and you be that change and you be that better person, mm -hmm. not just to your neighbor, not just you know to the world about caring about them, but how are you actually treating your neighbors? It's down to that, that you know I think is a spiral effect. Yeah. The, off, the offline relationships. Yes, yeah. behind closed doors, yeah. you know, how are you really? When no one is watching. Yeah. Medicine in life aka what makes you happy when you're in 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 a mood or you really need to be uplifted what what never fails you what do you go to number one for me is sunshine um 
there's even studies that back that the sun is also very healing. And um, I love nutrition as well. So <laughs> the vitamin D levels are extremely low in Saudi because it's very hot and they cover themselves from the sun in this. But for me, my number one medicine that is, you know, pretty much always there, great, like thankfully in Saudi yeah. is the sun. It brings me a lot of peace and relaxing and, you know, again, quite literally a light that can keep you moving and it will get to dark and it will be light again. So it's just, an, again, another analogy for life that pulls me through. And then I would say, you know, nutrition, having my smoothie, having, you know, giving my body fuel and healthy things really quite literally is my medicine to that and travel. Travel always. Before we get into your travel and what you put in your smoothie, so you probably <laughs> agree with the sentence that on the subject of light and sunlight, you probably agree with the sentence that the best things in life are free. Exactly. Be being out there. By the way, exactly. the, the, vi the vitamin, yeah, the, the sun definitely, definitely gives you energy, endorphins, dopamine. There's something there. It feels there, like I a, feel nat it. a natural energy source to me. And when I don't have it, which is why I, I personally really struggle to also live somewhere gloomy because the mm -hmm. sun, it does. So that's, why that's why you moved here. That's why you moved here. The truth comes out. <laughs> the truth comes out. <laughs> no, just another cherry on top though, really. That's, yeah. 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 You can't, yeah, I, I mean, you, you feel it, by the way. Like when I'm in London and it's Jan or Feb, and if, I, if I'm sleeping in that day as in waking up, I'm sorry, guys, but if I'm waking up at 10.30, 11 a.m. That's early for Saudi time. <laughs> Let's be honest. All right, I mean, some people could wake up at 2 or 3. But, but if you are one of those people that wake up at 2 or 3, the sun is pretty much set in, in Jan or Feb in yeah. London at 2 or 3. Mm -hmm. You can miss out on on any vitamin D intake that you can get on that day. And we'd be lying if we said you don't feel those, you know, repercussions after so long, you, you know? It's, there's there's scientific proof of the benefits of sun and vitamin D and, and vitamin D is mood and immune system and everything. So it's not just, I actually feel good, um, but there it actually has benefits yeah. for the body, so yeah. Whenever I speak to people from Scandinavia, I'm like, by the way, it's one of the, 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 the most regions in the world that I want to visit that I haven't been to yet. Norway, Sweden, Denmark. <clears throat> They were like, just don't come in the winter. No, no, no. You know, like it's almost like they cringe that you do not want to be there in the winter, where where the sun probably sets at noon. Yeah, it's complete darkness. Up, up in uh, Iceland. Yeah, I've done Iceland yeah, yeah. in the winter, and you barely even get daylight. Oh God! It's, you barely even get daylight. It was hard. Like everybody love a lot of people love Iceland, and I'm not one to love cold places, but it's beautiful. So I'm in for a place that's beautiful in this. But but you grew yeah, up in Chicago. I mean, Chicago was. But that's why I run. <laughs> I grew up in Chicago when I moved to California, my whole life shifted when I was like, every day sunny, a sunny day in California, you don't even have to look out. And and that's when I started realizing how much of a mood difference what you want. people in Chicago had versus California. Mm -hmm. It really does affect, you know, it's why people are more depressed in the winter and the gloomy months because it's, you know, it's some correlation, definitely. Definitely, it does have an effect. Um, ever failed at something where eventually you were like, I'm glad I failed at that because it, it it made me the person I am today. Like it was a good failure. Um, I would say pretty much life as a whole. I think I'm not necessarily sure I'd use the warm, warm, <laughs> warm, warm. <laughs> I think everything in life is a series of, if you want to use the word failures, um, but I would rather use the term lessons and i'm going to go to another quote that my mom has been telling me since i was a young girl one of the things i've always remembered is look at everybody in your life as a teacher and everything in your life as a lesson so nothing is inherently good or bad it is only our perceptions that perceives if whatever event or whatever thing is happening is bad thing or a good thing so by managing the only thing we have control of which is ourself we're able to look at things from a different life. And if we look at things as just lessons, then nothing is quite a failure and everything is just growing ourself and our knowledge and you know, allowing us down the road to live a happier, more fulfilled life. So all of these, you know, quote unquote failures or lessons, um, I'm so grateful for. And it's easy to say, oh my gosh, I wish I didn't have to feel that pain and why I've been yeah. You know, I've had a really, personally, I've had a really difficult year and it's been very personal, like a very year of personal growth, which had I had not gone through so much external different 
factors that were causing me suffering and pain, um, I would have never, you know, uh, grew myself in such a way. How do I not experience how painful it can be? That was my next question. Did you grow? So much, so much. And I think that is, you know, I'm proud of myself. And I think we need to give more acknowledgement to our own selves when we're going through things that, you know, I've taken those steps to take something that, you know, could destroy somebody and take that as like, well, what, what did this teach me? Like, now I know better for next time. Now, you know, I won't feel this pain again. So rather than play the blame game, we don't like a lot of times in this, you know, this day and age, we like to play the blame game. You know, they did this to me, they did that. But it's like, well, you know, what aspect did that play in your life? What could have you done better for your own self? Or how could you have, you know, made those emotions not allowed them to make you so angry or make you so sad, like, or let yourself feel it and get over it rather than distract yourself from it, rather than, you know, go out with friends and just constantly stay busy. I think that's another thing. We have so many distractions, phones and, you know, FOMO, the fear of missing out, of mm -hmm. going places and events that it's hard to, to step out of that, to that light. And that, is so important for people to be able to be alone and go through something in order to fully grow and, and to heal, you know, so you're not bleeding on other people from your own traumas and your own things that you go through. So true. The whole bleeding analogy uh, is, is, is something that I've seen, I've seen it in myself. I, I've, I've seen it in me not healing from something that I affected the people closest to me because I've, I'm, I'm bleeding on them. Totally. Uh, and I think that's where therapy comes in. You know, we, we and maybe the older generation still don't believe in, in, in therapy, but but our generation does. And I think it's very important. Yeah. And I love how there is more access to therapy with mm -hmm. these apps that are coming online. It's no longer a fortune. You have to pay yeah. for it. hundred dollars an hour with this therapist. No, I, I mean, not, not to call out any apps, but, but there are a few out there now where you can book uh, a one-on-one -on -one with exactly. someone for, for a fraction of, of, of that cost. Again, getting what's in here out there, basically. definitely, which I think it's really important. And again, as being, you know, having any sort of platform as well is normalizing that we all have emotions and a lot of us have a lot of trauma that's even from child. And, you know, it's OK to feel things deeply and it's it's OK to talk about them and it's OK to be hurting. And, you know, without needing to revenge or do this, like, let's all like, you know, agree to make a change in our, you know, starting with ourselves and mm. see how everything else changes by doing that. And and therapy should absolutely be normalized. And that was something growing up, I couldn't afford therapy. And it was probably frowned upon like, oh, she's in therapy. Yeah. Now it is becoming a little bit more normalized. So we should keep on that and having access to the media and different things is amazing. And and even some way that I coped for so many years is how, how I, I had this urge to always want to grow and do better was reading. There are so many self-help books that are a form of therapy that, you know, journaling to get the words out mm -hmm. and then, you know, reading to to process your emotions, process your thoughts. Like there's endless, um, you know, Truly. things to Truly. help. I recently asked two of my friends before I go for a bathroom break, because I really need it. <laughs> I asked two of my friends recently, how are you buddy? How are you doing? And I loved their answer because it's typically great, man. How are you? How are the kids? Their answer was not too good. Mm -hmm. I was like, do you want to talk about it? I, I'll drop everything. Let's talk about it. And they were like, uh, when the time actually funny, both both of them said yes, but but just just not right now. Mm -hmm. But I do. I'm going to come to you when I, when I can. And I was like, I I, I don't. I, I think if it wasn't for the era that we're in right now, where it's okay to to discuss mental health related topics or speak about you know what what's happening in here and and not try to guard it and be all alpha about it that you know I'm macho and I'm good. Uh, it as much as I I wasn't happy to hear that they're going through it, but. I was happy to hear that they were willing to talk about it. That's huge. And you speaking on that is interesting because it was something that I've kind of realized through, you know, having guy friends and this type of thing is what I kind of came to a realization is that a lot of men as a whole, are, I feel like have a disservice um, as a social norm from the age of when you grow up, boy, little boys and, you know, becoming men, it's it's this thought that they have to be strong and not have emotions, like rub some dirt on it, you know, don't cry, men don't cry. And I think it, you know, I realized in a lot of my, you know, guy friends that it does such a disservice to how they communicate and how they manage their emotions and trauma today. Because from since a child, they've had that, that they have to be that manly, don't speak about it. So um, I think it's beautiful that, 
you know, people and men specifically, anybody, everybody that we can step forward and yeah, acknowledge like I'm not okay. And like, let's talk about it. Yeah. This is what we need more of everybody. You'll find out that you actually feel a lot better after you do let it out of here to someone who That's is willing right. to listen to you. And, and and even someone who's willing to listen to you is is, is, is a gift in its own. Yeah. Because most people don't care. So if one person asks you how you're doing and you feel that they, they mean it, it's open up to them. You'll feel better after it. I got to pee. Yeah. I'll ask you a question, then you ask me one. Okay. Something that's improved your life so much, you wish you started it a long time ago. Having boundaries. Boundaries. By the way, that's come up a lot in recent episodes for me. Really? Boundaries. Boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to yeah. catch up on my Mo episodes. So, but something for you to I'm do. I'm glad to hear that actually, because. It's something that I don't think we're taught. I think you kind of have to learn through your own pain and, you know, experiences. So if we could have a little bit more knowledge or like hmm, boundaries, let's look into this. So do I have boundaries in my life? Do I set boundaries? Is everybody treating me bad or am I allowing them to treat me this way? I don't want to be a doormat anymore. Did you felt that you were? Um. Did you feel that you were? What's up with my English today? I didn't, I never thought about it. I just always have kind of been this empathetic, kind, easygoing, you know, I don't like conflict just type of person. Get along with everybody, fine. But I've realized that um, through some personal experiences that I was essentially allowing people to, to treat me as a doormat, to walk over me. And had I have had more boundaries of like, you know, I like to do this, I don't like to do this, or say no, or, you know, standing up for things that you would prefer to do, or um, things such as this, then, you know, I could have avoided feeling that pain through them, which now I've learned. So, yeah. Growth. Growth. Yeah. Like you, you, going into 2024, based on what I'm hearing you saying, in 2024, you won't allow people to treat you. Um, not not specifically in 2024, but like in like going forwards, you will not allow people to treat you the way that you have perhaps allowed them to treat you in the last few years. Correct, and um, it's it's an interesting topic, and it kind of pulls at different heartstrings as I'm thinking about it, because I I don't want to not be kind, and I'm not that type of person to be mean, and I think we have this association that that's mean or you're a mean person or like you know it's okay to lose people and to filter out those people that aren't okay with your boundaries and by setting your boundaries you're you know you're respecting yourself you're respecting your goals your values and your own self and you know if saying no to anybody makes you lose them then it was meant to be and you know that's a blessing which I, I didn't really realize I always wanted to like protect everything and keep everything peaceful and it was a disservice to myself like I became um it, it affected my physical health as well like trying to meet up to you know people's expectations and you know go to as many things as I could go to but those aren't things that serve me so had I have a boundaries and like it's okay to say no it's okay to not go to something because you're supposed to go to it like being in the industry you should go to this event you should network here you should do that but like I'm most me when I'm in nature when I'm traveling when I'm experiencing you know, new things and, and with like-minded good people. I'm not most myself when I'm, you know, at all of these events. And although I'm grateful for the opportunities and it's super fun and amazing to be a part of so much change, you know, happening specifically here, it's those things, you know, suck a lot of life out of me. And and it took me a long time to realize that. And it was just another thing that had I had boundaries or just say no to more things, then I could have found a healthy balance of going to the things I enjoyed and then still maintaining, you know, my peace rather than protecting, you know, my image or what people want me to be. You're stronger today, though. Much stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Ajina muhabbara b'shabab. Gawamaha khafif u hash. U ta'amaha wala arwa. Allowing people to walk all over you is uh, is is a horrific 
admission or facility that you give people. And, and I think only when we get slapped right across our face do we realize, excuse me, I'm never like I'm never gonna let that happen to me yeah. again. Totally. That's why it crucial. Pain pain is crucial and allowing yourself to feel that pain is crucial because only have you feel that pain can you know not only will I not do it to somebody else because it's painful, but you know, I'm gonna have my guard and not allow, not give somebody that door to open to to do that to me. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And 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 that's why Good things come from hard times. Yeah, it's true. Nothing good comes from easy. No. Comfort zone, easy. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing, nothing is built there. No. no. I think that the, the best converse, the, the, the best things happen in the moments where you speak to yourself. Speak to yourself in in, 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 in a way because you're so furious of the situation you're in. So we have these, go, how did I let myself do? But I should have known better. But, but, but. And that's where growth happens. Yeah. I will never let this happen to me. Absolutely. So not too dissimilar or far away from the topic. If I was going to ask you something that you have been better at saying no to. I know we said, you know, boundaries and all that. But what's something that you used to say yes to a lot that today you're seeing yourself saying no to more? Saying no to things that I don't want to do. You don't want to do. That's that I don't important. want to do. And I think... I didn't think I didn't want to not do these things. I think it was more, I was fine doing any of it. I'm excited to, you know, experience all sorts of different, you know, type of scenarios in life. And I was go with the flow, but there was a, like a limit where it was like, you know, I don't really feel like going here or doing this or getting ready and doing this or, you know, being around these people or just like, and I would still go. And it's like in those moments, if you don't want to, nobody's, telling you no one has control of that other than you like you have to have that boundary to be able to say no and know that you know I was it was no longer serving me or no longer serving my soul I think I could have had a really nice balance of doing events and things that I like and also you know taking care of myself and what I want to do I think one of one of the biggest things I could think about with this scenario is that how when you're in a room full of people could you feel so lonely? And that's what I can think about, about my last, honestly, year and a half. And it was, it's great and amazing in so many ways. Um, but it very much turned into feeling that way to my soul. And, and I could, it's easy to just point my finger and blame, you know, either, either which way, but the truth and the self-awareness is that I chose, you know, I didn't have the boundaries and I didn't say no as often as, you know, I knew in my soul I was whether I was being burnt out or whatever, that I just, I needed to take those breaks for myself. That's pretty dark and deep to hear that uh, in a room full of people, you felt lonely. Is it because you couldn't relate to them or is it because you couldn't open up to them or? Um, I wouldn't think it's not because I can't open up for them. I think the environments, the consistent environments that I was putting myself in of, you know, maybe the same type of people. It, it was all very much kind of like, who are you and what do you do, which is fine. And I think, you know, with um, a balance, that's really nice and really fun to put yourself in new experiences and meet all sorts of people. But again, I, I maybe abused that. I, I was doing too much. I was constantly busy going to every event, it's like everything was happening. Dinner, have to, I have to do these connections here, do this here. It's like, I want to go to something and do something because it is what I want to do, not from any outer pressure from media or social or friends or you can't miss this. You can't not do this. You can't like. Phone is a bitch. Yeah. Mm. Now I have JOMO. It's the joy of missing <laughs> out. <laughs> and that's taken a long time to like not have that FOMO. Yeah. And it's very freeing. Yeah. It's very freeing. And I connect you know, I feel like I'm a, I'm attracting now people into my life that are aligned with my values and um, good souls and good characters and, and in-depth conversations. Like, I'm just not somebody that I can't stand a lot of surface level conversations. I, to be honest, I don't, I don't really care what you do or who you are, but um, I want to know, you know, what brings you joy? Like, I want to know the depths of, you know, you as a person. We are not all of these labels that we are given or that we essentially kind of give to ourselves. We are so much more. And and that's the kind of conversation I want to have, not like how can I benefit from you or who can benefit from me? It's like 
it really transactional. It really transactional. Transactional, yeah. Did you ever feel that you were a pushover? Yes, you because I didn't have boundaries. Absolutely, yes. So it's like I can say this person hurt me or this person did this to me that was really horrible, and it's like, but essentially, how did I allow them that door to enter and to do that to me? Had I have just had a little bit more boundaries and just listening, listening to your gut and what your body tells you, like, you know, what's morally, you know, good. And it, it kind of can direct you if things don't feel right in your soul, whether it's just doing a job that you're not comfortable with, like something as little as that we may like, oh, but it's this price or it's this, this, but it's like, if it doesn't align with your soul, not only is your, that outcome, people are going to feel that in genuineness, the inauthenticity of it, but it's doing a disservice to yourself and your overall happiness. Like money cannot buy happiness. Your status is never going to buy happiness. It's so much deeper. It's a great word, inauthenticity. Making a note about that. <laughs> I thought I was going to like jumble that word when it came out. Like, I don't know. When you were talking about, um, is this serving me anymore? It reminded me of a conversation I had with someone who had control over my life for many years. And I told him that uh, the situation I'm in is no longer serving me, mm. which is a very fair thing to say. For sure. But it just shows you how far away our thought processes, our how everything aligned between where I saw things and he saw things, and his response to that senior corporate role, obviously very very toxic relationships that, that, that can come from that. But his response to the situation is not serving me was classic response. You should be serving it. Oh. Okay. And, and that was the big that was the beginning of the end for me in corporate life. Wow. It took eighteen months after that conversation. But that's when I knew that the first hammer the first nail is going to be hammered home. Good for you. I actually hammered that was like I'm like, this is when I'm going to start planning my exit. Good for you. Yeah. How do you want me to serve? How do you want me to serve it if it doesn't serve me first? Mm. Like, if I'm not happy, comfortable, secure, you want me to do my best work? Ask me that question. <laughs> but I, That's I, could, right. I, I couldn't say that to him back then, you know. But yeah. like, but like, because when you're in the depths of the darkness. This is all you have. You have to be submissive or else you're yes. going to lose your job. And, mm -hmm. and that's why corporate relationships can be so toxic sometimes. For sure. Um, but, but yeah, what's not serving you is what I want to get to. And ask yourself, what, what's not serving you? Uh, and then, and, and, and if it's not, then, and, and you have the ability to pivot, then, then do so. But just to, to have a response from the other side saying, you're supposed to be serving it. I was like, wow. Hmm. Yeah. Now, now I know. Now yeah. I know. Which it, sometimes people go their whole life and not kind of having that realization. We become, you know, kind of robots to society of what we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to do. You know, we have to have this status. We have to have these, you know, things. And that determines how people are going to treat us based on all of these things. And, you know, your happiness and everything else suffers if you're not first leaning into yourself and you're like, this isn't serving me. Yeah. What would you do? And I think everybody should ask themselves this. And and I know it's, you know, there's some speculation of like, well, but I have to live and I have to support my family and I have to do all these things. So, you know, I have to work. And, and I'm not saying don't work, but if you have no option but to work this job to survive, what would you do if you didn't make money from it? Like, what is the one thing that you would do? And if you can turn that into an occupation, great. And if, you know, you don't have the means to do that, at least make more time for yourself to do these things that you would do if you weren't making money and and prioritize that, but not just prioritizing your work and your job. Like if you need vacation and, you know, you're being overworked and stand up for yourself. Someone's not treating you right in your workplace. Like, you know, you, you can stand up for yourself. You set those boundaries. Don't let the status or, you know, whatever tier of people above you to think that you don't have a right to how you feel. And, and if you lose your job or, you know, friends because you're signing up for yourself, then it's a blessing to you. They weren't meant to be there they in weren't. the first place. They weren't. Yeah. So it's really, I'm I'm so proud of you as well. And I think we need to take a moment. No, we don't. For that, yes, we do. Because when I first was on the show, you were still, you know, working that job and, 
you know, doing this as a passion and a hobby. And I, you know, admire you for that, that you kept going and kept doing. And, and now, you know, it led you to that courage to be like, you know what? No, that's making me miserable. And, you know, this is what I love and I'll take a risk. And even if I struggle for a little bit, you know, it works itself out. When you give that true passion and love towards something, it's, it's going to prevail over anything. Just be patient. Appreciate you acknowledging that. I love that question. Is it, I love the question you just posed that if, if money wasn't an object, what would you be doing in life? Uh, I think it's a conversation that many people should have with themselves. Yeah. And then find a way to monetize from that. Like I never heard that second part of the question. Yeah, that's that's, that's good. pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. good. And nowadays yeah. we have the platforms to do it. So whatever it is, you know, use that and get creative. Like let's explore. We're not meant to be stagnant and just, you know, go through the motions of life. Let's enjoy it and let's live it and let's take some rest out of our comfort zone and go through the pain and you see where it leads us. This is why I wanted to get you on the second time around. Because the first time was fluffy and on the surface. <laughs> fluffy. And I told you that if we were going to do... <laughs> I was a little bit fluffier back then in general too. <laughs> Gone through, you know, a lot. <laughs> I meant... <laughs> I like that term. <laughs> I mean, that meant it in the, in the, yeah, in, in the term of depth of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not physical. Not physical form. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I asked you, when we spoke a few weeks ago, I said, uh, Paris, but I, I want I want to go deep and I, and I want you to speak your heart and unleash and, and thank you for doing just that. Actually, you kind of led the conversation that way as well, oh. especially in the in the last 10 minutes. Like, like you you have pushed. By the way, you still have to ask me a question. I haven't forgot. You, I you've, 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 you've gone for it. You've, you've, you've showed a, a vulnerable side and you've, and 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 that's the side that I I wanted to show because a lot of people know you as the photographer, the artist, uh, and I wanted to give people a chance to get to know you and and me as a part of the parcel, uh, as the person, the human, which more people can relate to than Paris, the profession. Yeah. And um, and thank you for opening up the way you have. Uh, if I was to ask you the question you just asked me, being if money was no object what you what would you be doing to me mm -hmm. to you yes i don't see your mom here <laughs> i thought we were asking you that one time <laughs> i was told by a cousin of mine mo don't lead the witness and i was going to say is it what you're doing but i said no <laughs> <laughs> um what would you be doing that was how i got to where i am so by doing what i loved it created a platform naturally to do everything I've been doing. And, and I'm grateful for everyone that's followed my journey since then to do what I love. And to be honest, the reason everyone asks, why don't you have a million followers? Why don't you have this? And the reason is because I'm not consistent. And the deeper reason of why I'm not consistent is because I'm also human. And, you know, I'm a creative soul that really relies on feeling creative. And that's a lot with my environment and my emotions. And um, to you know, to lie to myself and post every day just to stay relevant doesn't align with my beliefs or my morals or who I am. So I would say that I'm still doing what I love, which is, you know, making art and sharing those these experiences with people. And I do it regardless if I'm making money. And I'm but I'm grateful that I can. Um, now, a lot has changed. And, you know, those things fluctuate. I'm not I don't have to stay that way. There's could be different things that bring me joy. And I think through these years, simplicity is something that I really value and I see myself almost doing a full circle back to being much more simple in every way and like home life, things, people, events, um, just being, you know, I would love to have a little like farmhouse growing my own garden. With in some cats. <laughs> yes. And then just like going to things here and there, just making art and capturing moments and, you know, living peacefully and um, so not too far away from what you're doing today. No, yeah. I hope to, you know, continue Cle going clearly, in that direction. Clearly um, your passion. The way yeah. the, the, the way you're so, how, how you're so meticulous about your work, you, you don't do that if it's not something you're into. Totally. Your mom told me a lot about how much time you take in capturing the right shot. And this conversation I had with her almost three years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that was clear to me then that, yeah, this is something that you are very passionate about. Yeah. You take and it seriously. Very seriously. And there's that same thing that, okay, the algorithm and, 
you know, what sells and, and what people are interested in changes like as we evolve, which is very true. But I'm going on my own baseline of my own, you know, evolution. And, you know, if I don't feel like doing a TikTok or a reel this certain way and a certain trend is aligned with what I actually enjoy doing or make, I'm not going to do it. So there was this big period where they had reels introduced on Instagram and it was like, you have to, nobody's po- nobody's like sharing photos and liking photos. You have to do reels to stay relevant. And I, I felt this like I had to do it. And I was probably one of the few people that I know of my friends that didn't fall into it. And I still would post photos. And I recently even went to Egypt and posted a photo and it was one of my most viral content. Like, Aswan? Had, like, Aswan? Uh, Siwa. Was- What's Siwa, Aswan? Egypt. That's Aswan, where you went. I've been to Aswan as well, but, but the one Siwa was recently. the recent one, yeah, which is insane and absolutely incredible. And it embodies just what I just told you about going back to complete simplicity. The resort is beautiful naturally. It's in the middle of nowhere. like Middle you, of nowhere. How did you guys get there? You went to Cairo and then? We fly into either Cairo or Alexandria, and it's yeah. like a eight to 10 hour drive, like rustic off-roading. Oh. Cool. It's the middle of nowhere. And this place is naturally beautiful things are made from like you know salt and sand and all natural materials and it's candlelit there's no electricity there's no in the town in the whole resort there yeah. in the town there is some but the the specific resort in siwa which embodies a lot of what siwa is is like back to nature and natural and keeping that a safe space i believe like celebrities go there and stuff to get away and be off grid and you know you live this full simplistic life of candlelit i mean i don't know if we can fathom like taking a shower at night and the only thing that's lit is the candle and like there's can, just can something a, so special a few pictures up absolutely um, of the resort yeah yeah the one of my most viral photo that i posted has over fifty thousand likes that's not even just the engagement or the views but it went viral and this is when everybody's telling me you have to only do reels it's the only thing that's going to work Oops. and i was like i'm staying true to what i enjoy which is mainly photos i still like videos but mainly photos and you know you know that genuine That's your authentic yeah, self yeah, your... stays true yeah. and but you push yourself i love that you push yourself to do more on camera talk and Trying. i was like oh she could start her own podcast that is out of my comfort <laughs> so you're pushing that thankfully <laughs> again a lot of people don't really know the depths of me although i love depth yes that's it yes this one so it's never i've never seen it on instagram it's never been anywhere and those are places that got me to saudi that's the idea that got me to saudi wow and I still have someone wow. more to share on there, but I think it's just such a special place that you almost want to keep keep it close to you. For, for for a second, when you said no electricity, I thought that the resort maybe is in an area that's cut off, or you know they they they, they chose to go without the expense of electricity. But it looks like a very nice resort that just the part of the vibe is no electricity. Yes, we can afford it, but we're not gonna we're not gonna that provide is, it. Oh, they can they can afford it, but it keeps that they've just kept it the wow. way the way that it is natural. Like Siwa has tons of natural pools and salt lakes, and it has a very natural you know essence to it. So they've taken that to build like the beds are made of salt and sand and wood, and it, like it's just it's you, so special. You, That's the direction I've got. Oh go. my gosh, it was a highlight of you Siwa know a lot Oasis. of my life. I'm just trying to see on the map because I'm a very, it's like the only subjects I did well it's in. by the border Geography, yes. Libya, yeah, Libya. Yeah. Um, yeah, Libya. Yeah, Libya. Yeah. So another reason people are like a little bit like, oh, it's a little bit fearful. And it's like, that is where I like to go. So that was my most recent kind of exploration that I highly, highly recommend. And from Cairo, you said eight hour drive. A little bit longer because then it's off-roading. There's nothing out there. It's just desolate. But that makes you appreciate that you know, in destination so much when you really work for it, which they keep it like that for that reason, you know? Eight, 740 kilometers, about 500 miles away. My goodness. It's a beautiful part of, of, of Egypt, I'm sure. There'd be people yeah. go to the North Coast, you know, Cairo, Alexandra, but but that is really off the grid. And how, who told you about it? How do you find it? Um, How do you find these things, by the way? Where did I first find it? I of secrets. It had been mentioned or I heard of it like ages ago. And then I had actually, funny enough, now it's like full circle connecting, Aziz. Um, Hola. Aziz Alula. Yeah. He went to it and he would tell me about this place. And when I was searching to go to this place, he would tell me it's one of his favorite places in the world. No electricity, no nothing. And I always had that in my mind. And then when I was looking into the place that I could think of, I found that resort and I saw one of his photos there with it. And I was like, 
is this the place? And he's like, yes, yes, you must go. And so I can thank him really for the introduction and for really opening my eyes to that place. Awesome. Awesome. Amazing. People treat enemies or they see enemies as people who they can either be enemies with for the rest of their lives or forgive them, pivot and move on. And I, and I stumbled upon this question recently that said, do you forgive your enemies of yesteryear or those who you are, who you are currently battling with? Uh, how would you answer the question of, of enemies and where you are, if you have any, in forgiving them? Do I have people that have done me wrong and intentionally hurt me? Yes. Do I consider them my enemies? And do I have any enemies? No. I, for as long as I remember, I, I believe I don't have any enemies. And I think forgiving them for yourself is one of the most you know, powerful things you can do for your mental, emotional state and for you to grow as a person. So I forgive the people that have hurt me and, you know, I will never try to, I think it's in our nature to, to want to like hurt them back or do this, but you're only really hurting yourself at the end of the day. So I forgive. Have you learned more from your enemies or your friends? What a, what a question that just came That to is a deep question. Say your enemies. enemies. It, Again, I wouldn't call it enemies, but those people that hurt you, yeah. definitely you learn the most from them. And if everything was perfect and, you know, you avoid this pain and avoid that, then, you know, you may not realize you're hurting people as well because we haven't, you haven't experienced that pain enough to know that, you know, maybe these little things also hurt people in my life, which, you know, I had those moments of realization that, oh, wow, I would maybe not be the best person and thought it was innocent, but it does actually hurt. Like, maybe I should be a better friend and a better this and... um these type of things. What do you tell five-year-old Paris if you had a conversation with her today? I don't know if it's something maybe I would tell her, but I would like to teach her um, communication. And I know that seems quite simple, but I think expressing and communicating on all levels, saying no, having boundaries, all these things are correlated. And, you know, had I kind of been taught that as a young girl, I maybe would have, you know, stood more in my power and had more control of, you know, my happiness and things like that earlier on. I think it took me a lot of things to go through to to learn how important it is to communicate and not just be stubborn and shut down like I would normally do and just maybe escape and, and jump on the next plane or whatever. It's more like, so what you did. let's talk about. <laughs> you, you, that's a, it's an interesting coping mechanism. Um, Skip town. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems like it's quite drastic when you say it like that, but... I think it became a way of protecting my peace. And at the time, I didn't think it was maybe escaping, but, you know, being still and maybe have not explored as much this last year and a half or two years by being still and being in myself, I was able to, you know, learn so much more than had I just, you know, jumped away and went to the next new destination. It's a distraction. It's just another form of distracting. So being able to communicate emotions, I think is very priceless. It's everything. Yeah. So the amount of people that told me communication, like I've had conversation with, with aunts and uncles who've been married for 50 years and I asked them, what's the secret? And they said, communication. That's why we're still together. Mm, it yeah. is. And you can apply that to so many parts of your life. Definitely. That's why I think it applies to everything. So it's really big mm. and we're not really taught that. But I didn't ask you a question yet. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> um... Okay, now I need another second because I thought second. I knew what I wanted to ask. Um, you know, out of your whole life and, you know, out of your whole life and, you know, a large range of different circumstances and different pain and different things that led you to who you are and where you are today. Is there any specific event or moment that stands out to you in the most that contributed to your growth or to who you are right now today? One above all. I don't think you're ready for the answer though. <laughs> like, hey, are you going to tell us now? It's going to get very somber. <laughs> but but one, and I, I don't even think there's a second. At least I can't think of a second. Burying my father, mm. 21 years old. 
I was. He was 63. Wow. So sorry. That's... Yeah. I remember going home after the burial and crying into a pillow for three or four hours. But at the end, because that was my morning, at the end of that four hours, and then they say it's important to mourn, right? I didn't know yes. what that meant until until I went through that. Mm-hmm. But at the end of that, I realized that you're on your own. Mm. No one's your favorite. I didn't realize that no one's going to come to save you until later on. Oops. Yeah. But I realized that I was on my own. No longer do I have that person, my, my brother, God bless him, did everything he can to be a father figure and, and what a job he did. But he wasn't my father. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you only have one father, right? Yeah. Uh, that was the moment when, and in the years to unfold, did I see myself becoming more independent, more self-sufficient, more not relying on anyone, self-reliant, you know, all those mm-hmm. uh, words uh, in comparison to my cousins and my peers and my friends. Well, it was a good, I mean, if we can, if we can take the silver lining from losing a parent. That's everything. It's every, take the silver lining. Say, take the silver lining, yeah. Like, but I'm so far ahead of, like, I do things on my own where my cousins and my friends go to their fathers or their father's assistants for. Yeah. But I, I got that shit done on my own. Uh, and I felt that when I did outgrow my peers, I felt my father smiling down at me. Oh. Yeah, it's kind of like the gift he left me with. Yeah. So for for sh- not, uh, not 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 to make you cry, <laughs> but I don't think there was a, a, another moment for me to like answer your question where there was it was just that moment which made me feel that you know I. It was a life-changing moment yeah. for me. N- not, nothing, nothing changed the course of my life more than that. Wow. Nothing. Yeah, it didn't take you no. more than a second to just say. Yeah. No, no, I, I mean, I knew it from your maybe fourth or fifth word. Is there something that you would say to him today? If you had one last thing that you could say to him today, is there something that you would say? Or something, or something that he taught you that resonates with you that you'd like to be grateful for, to tell him? Other than the wide range of things you learned from in passing. I don't think I... This is the Paris show now. This is... <laughs> by, by, by the way, you, 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 are you trying to start a podcast? <laughs> you should. Never know. Um, I don't I, I don't think I took most of his advice. I didn't. In the five years or so following his death. T- t- today, yes, perhaps, yeah. yeah. But at the time, I was an idiot and... Um, not to say that I know anything today, but he always used to preach, show up on time for anything. Funnily enough, dress dress well. Mm-hmm. You know, dress well. He was an executive in Saudi Airlines for 25 years, mm-hmm. and I was fortunate enough to travel business class for a fraction of the price. But oh, nice. I, I came in with the way I'm dressed today, you know, <laughs> T-shirts and tracks. And he and many times he'd be like, "Listen, when you're with me, you cannot dress that <laughs> that way." Uh, but he always used to say, "You know, dress to impress," because you never know who you're gonna meet. Mm-hmm. I remember him saying so many things that I'm reading today in in, in self development books. Wow, be punctual. That. Always dress up because you never know who you're gonna meet. Nice. Be be polite, but stand your ground. Mm-hmm. Another weird thing that maybe fathers don't preach their sons not that i had a problem with it but he was always like your hygiene is very important and i'm like bob but like do you do you smell me he's like no but it's important to be groomed it's important to take you know two you know two showers a day mm-hmm. it's important to have your hair you know like just be presentable be presentable yeah. he was an executive in an airline so he wow. knew all about presentability he was the english voice of the airline wow. he started one of the funnily enough he's he co-founded one of the he co-founded the first Saudi radio station back in the early no. 70s in Saudi. What? And that's why some of his Wait, friends and uncles say, by the way, what you're doing today is, is what your father was doing 50 years oh, ago. Like, gives me chills. Right? Like, wow. Because I can never relate to him as the airline executive. Yeah. I could only, I only wow. survived a decade in corporate, but I can definitely relate to him as wow. somebody who started an English radio station. And he was the public spokesperson for the airline, Saudi Airlines. Wow. And then you were just recently in London and you didn't you say 
And weren't you wearing a suit? I was. Also, and then, but you're there for Visit Saudi. Yeah, it's for, like for Visit Saudi. Full circle thing. So you're funny. like, Dad, yeah. you be proud. Well, when I'm in London, I'm you know I I wake up wearing tracks and a hoodie. I just wasn't used to wearing a suit <laughs> at eight a.m. and taking the tube all the way to this place off the map. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but you know, being there and with Visit Saudi and and seeing Saudi Airlines next to us, who just wow. rebranded into their own into their old logo. Love it. Their old era that 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 he was part of. You, you, how about that? Wow, like I, I, when, I had cool. actually I had two captains on a few weeks ago and then they asked me they were like what do you think of the new branding I was like in the beginning I felt that it it served its purpose but but then the green got me and the minimalism and how much my father would would be smiling if he saw wow. it today because because that was introduced from 74 up until 98 wow. that was my dad's era wow and then they went to the new one which didn't really have the same stickiness to it. Definitely. But but this one, I had to, you know, it, it had to grow on me. And today, no, I would I would much rather this than than, than the old. Wow. Love so that. yeah, full full circle moment yeah. for for sure for sure. Any more questions, Paris? Or are you done? <laughs> because I mean, I don't like being grilled here. <laughs> you have to stay tuned <clears throat> for something new, something exciting. You've done a lot for us in the last six years. And I mean Saudi, I mean the region, you've shown that um, Saudi, well, at least you know to your people and, and, and your followers online, that Saudi is not uh, what the media shows you. Here I am living, breathing proof of that. I've mm -hmm. been here for, well, back in our first episode, I've been here for three years and I've, I've been here for six and I ain't going nowhere. Yeah. So I think there's a lot that we have to thank you for in what you do. Oh. Uh, clearly, clearly, I don't even know if I asked you, does it feel like home? I don't think I did. I didn't because I know the answer to that. And I'm not going to ask questions that I know the answers to. I asked Benzema that question three days ago. Is it your second home? And he's like, bien sûr, mm -hmm. for sure. But I know the I know your answer to it. Yeah. It is, it, it, and, and maybe you would say it's my first home. Yeah. Not to take anything away from the US, beautiful country, you know, Chicago, I'm sure that area, California, like it's still home, it's still a part of you. But but today I, I feel like you know when you think of home, the picture you have in your mind is Eastern Province Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for hanging around, and I don't see yourself going anywhere in in, in the foreseeable future. Um, and I think you came at a really interesting time because you know before 2018 uh, things were different, and and now things are, are are so much better. And for you to witness the growth and the trajectory of of where the country is going, and to be able to 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 compare the dichot and to be able to to compare the dichotomy of before and after, mm -hmm. you have a really cool story to tell when it's when it's all said and done. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Definitely, it's you been and a your journey, for sure. And just to touch on your mom as well, because if it wasn't for her coming here, you wouldn't be here. No, I wouldn't. So she, so kudos to to her for taking the risk and saying, yeah, I'll go to that uh, misunderstood country and let me see what it's all about. Yep. No, I I owe it to her for introducing me. It's been transformative to my life okay. completely I bet. so thank you guys and everybody watching and all the saudis for welcoming me and allowing me to or insisting you know that it is also home to me we we, we definitely see you as uh as as someone who like genuinely enjoys being here and we just ask that you you know, keep celebrating on Saudi National Day. Wave that flag, <laughs> wh whether it's September twenty third or not. And uh, and again, honestly, like um, whether you like it or not, but but you are an ambassador uh, to the country. Soft power is real. Yeah. And you know, when you write in your bio on Instagram, uh, home with that pin, Saudi Arabia. I think it holds a little bit more weight than you think it might. It's nice to hear. This is where you can cry. Yes. <laughs> I am. I am inside. I'm so grateful for everything. Paris Vera, thank you. I, I genuinely mean it. Like you, you know how thankful I am for, for, for you and your mom and what you guys, uh, uh, just the fact that you are living here and you're calling it home, like that just puts a smile on my face. Even if you do nothing else, you know, just the yeah. fact that you call this home, thank you. Salute. Thank you. Get you on again one day with mom? Yellow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As we did at the end of uh, episode 16, there we go. Thanks, Paris. Thank See you, you again soon. All the best with everything going forward, yeah? Ashufik and Bukhara. Oh, wait, no.
Ashufik, inshallah. Inshallah. Is that the old Arabic you know? I mean, <laughs> we touched on the fact that you've been here for six years and we're not going to cut until you give us a All little... right, guys, that's a wrap. <laughs> Cheers, Paris. Cheers, <laughs> Paris.